Her Story is a program that explores women, leadership, and healthcare. Well, hi, everyone. It is great to be back with Her Story, and I am so pleased to introduce our guest for today's podcast, Ruth Williams Brinkley. She is the president of the Kaiser Foundation Health Plan Mid-Atlantic States. That's here in my home region of the DC, Maryland, Virginia area. And it is quite a responsibility, if I'm not mistaken, about 34 medical offices now and over 768 thousand members in that health plan. And of course, the other thing I think so relevant to our listeners on the Her Story podcast is Kaiser Permanente, uh, really an organization that has been promoting women and putting women in such important senior positions, executive positions of influence and importance. And uh, Ruth is an RN. We're going to talk a little bit about the move from clinical side over to C-suite. And she has had numerous CEO gigs throughout her career. And we'll talk about some of those travels and trails, if you will. So Ruth, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Cece. It's great to be here. I'm going to do something a little bit different than our typical conversation because you and I had a chance to talk and we were uh, focused on one of the important her story questions which is accidental or intentional leader and I'm so interested in your response there and I think it may kind of lay the predicate for a lot of our conversation today so can you start with uh, do you think of yourself as an accidental or intentional leader? You know, Cece, I view myself as an intentional leader. I didn't go into management or leadership thinking that I would uh, love to do that. However, after my first leadership role, I was hooked. And I love being a leader because you have such influence and such an ability to bring people together and build them into teams. So after that first time, I was very intentional. Fantastic. And so, of course, though, you were drawn to healthcare first clinical side as an RN. Talk to me a little bit about how that first kind of pulled you into this world, and then we can get to making the pivot. Okay. So I, I didn't uh, naturally go into nursing. It was a career that my, my grandmother guided me into. And once I was in it, I found that I really, I really liked it. And so I worked as a clinical nurse for, for years. And then I had the opportunity to get my first management role as a nurse manager. And I found that I really enjoyed it. And after that, I just kept doing different things. And I would say that my career progression has been defined by saying yes to opportunities. When I would be offered an opportunity, just as with my first role, I would say yes. And um, I didn't always know that I could master the role, but I knew I knew enough to um, to really do the role pretty well. And I just kept saying yes. And it has been a a great progression and and I'm very thankful. Will you tell us a little bit more about your grandmother who I suspect had a pretty significant influence? My grandmother absolutely did. She uh, was a teacher, which was pretty unusual for uh, an African-American woman back in those days. And she was very, very focused on education and is very strong. And she decided what everyone was going to be. And so my my role was to be the nurse in the family. Everybody else in the family uh, really are teachers. And I am the one that she selected for healthcare. and, And that's where I landed. Even though I resisted a little bit, I ended up exactly where she wanted me to be. That's so, that's terrific. And of course, then you listened to your grandmother, you became an RN, you did the clinical side for a while. How did you make the leap over to the executive team? You know, I, uh, so first of all, I was, um, 
after being a manager and house supervisor and area director, I became a chief nurse and um, I, I love that role and I worked at some fabulous organizations that I was really pleased to be a part of. And uh, then I spent some time in consulting uh, as a, in, a, in professional services. And once I left consulting, I started to be asked to do different kinds of things other than my core uh, experience area of nursing. And that's how I ended up being in, um, in ended up being in the executive chair outside of, in addition to a nursing role because the chief nurse is an executive role. Um, but then I had the opportunity to get into broader leadership after my experience in consulting. And that's what really changed. Uh, it was sort of, it changed my trajectory after that. I guess people saw me in a different way that I could do this, this really massive consulting, doing turnarounds. And so then I was asked to take on an interim CEO role. And then that led to a regular role. And after that, that was where I landed. So when you went into that first interim CEO role, any hurdles, hiccups, uh, challenges on that first one? I went into that role. I had not been a CEO before, but I had been a chief nurse. And I had a female uh, boss who really believed in me and asked me to do the interim role. And her boss, uh, who was the head of the system, um, didn't think I had enough experience to be the interim CEO, but she believed in me. And, and I'm so thankful to her. And I was to do that for five months, four or five months while they did the search. And after I was there, uh, the board of that, that health system uh, decided that they would invite me to be the CEO. And, um, and it was one of the best and most enjoyable uh, positions I've held. And then the person who was the head of the system did come back and say, you know what, I was wrong. I, I was wrong. You did a fabulous job. And, um, and, you know, I think he learned something from that as well. Wow. Good, good for you, but good for him for saying so too. Yes, he did say so. And, and I just thank the woman who believed in me and I believed in myself as well, because I had done so many things prior to that, that I knew I, I wasn't absolutely certain because I hadn't done this role before, but I always believe uh, Cece, that you don't have to have all the answers to everything. You just have to have the right questions and you need to know who has the right answers. And so that's the, that, because no one can know everything. And so you need to know what your resources are. Ruth, we, we often on the Her Story podcast discuss being, you know, the only woman at the table, the only woman in the room, the only woman on the board, that sort of thing. Um, but for you, I imagine you may have also frequently been the only person of color in many situations. So to be an African-American woman coming up through this industry, talk a little bit about that and how did you manage that? Going back to my grandmother, and I, I grew up in the segregated South, so um, that that's my background. My grandmother, being a teacher, never really taught us racism are really, she taught us that we could be whatever we wanted to be. And, and so I never had that in my head. And so I'm sure there, there must have been times when I was discriminated against or, or looked askance at uh, during those times, because many times I was both the only woman and the only African American in, in many of those rooms. And I didn't pay attention to it because I just wasn't taught that, that to, to do that. And then uh, what I noticed though, was a lot of times uh, when I would say something, and, and this is a classic story, uh, men and maybe somebody would say something, oftentimes not, and then a man would say the same thing. And, and someone, oh, what a great idea. So I just learned to say, well, thank you for building on my idea. I just said that. Thank you. And I learned to do it with grace, not with sarcasm. And you just learn. But it was, in retrospect, had I thought about it, I think it might have been crippling 
to my growth, but I didn't think about it that way. I thought that here I have a job to do. I've been hired for the job and I am going to do the very best I can. I love though your insight about not letting it be crippling. And I'm wondering if you can elaborate on that, especially for so many young women and people of color today trying to navigate very challenging situations in career and community and life. We're looking at disparities and equity issues. Um, what are your thoughts for those folks, both individually and maybe as a community? How do we move forward? I think, first of all, you have to believe in yourself and you have to get inside of your own head and to think the people sitting around these tables don't know any more than you do in most cases. And they are managing, they're there. You were chosen to be there and you have to have the confidence in knowing that someone had the confidence in you to place you in the role and you're just as good as the other people around the table. It can be intimidating to think that, oh, everybody else knows more than me. I'm the only black person, uh, African-American person. I'm the only woman. I'm the only Asian. I'm the only whatever. But you were chosen for that role uh, for a reason. And in most cases, you are as smart and in some cases smarter than the other people in the room. And what you have to learn to do is to work with others and not and, and not be intimidated uh, about being the only one. And, and sometimes, quite frankly, you are left out. It used to be prevalent that um, men would go to golf outings or go to golf or do the men kinds of things and not invite the women. And every hospital system, every, everybody has a golf tournament. And I learned to play golf. And I, I found that I really liked playing golf. And you have to learn to enjoy some of those things. You don't have to do all of them, but you, if you want to be a part of the group, you got to be a part of the team. I think you and me and Joanne Conroy and some of our other Her Story gals, we, we might just have to play one round for fun, Ruth. No, no boys allowed. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. You also have moved quite yes. frequently throughout your career. And, and I mean, literally geographically. Has that been hard on you and, and you have children and so for your family as well as you uh, moved up through your career? It was not hard for me. I always viewed it as a sense of adventure. My little area or town that I grew up in was teeny tiny. I mean, like maybe three or 400 people. So to call it a town would be a gross overstatement. And, but I was a reader because my grandmother wouldn't let us watch TV, what there was of TV back in those days. We had to read. And so I always read about places and different, you know, different countries, different cities. And so I wanted to know what those places were about. I wanted to experience them. So when it came time to me to move for my career, I, I you know, I thought, I really thought, how is this going to impact my children? But I was a single parent for a while and I knew that I was the sole support of my family. And so I had to make sure I made a living for them. And so I, most of my moves came after my son was uh, just about finished high school. My daughter got the brunt of it and I would feel sorry for her sometimes because we'd, she'd get settled and then I'd get a new job and we'd move again. It, it was difficult for her. I, I know it was. And she and I have talked about that. What I also know is that it made her very adaptable and very resilient. And it made her fearless that she could adapt to most situations without being, um, without being uh, intimidated. And I would take her to uh, events with me as my, as my escort, uh, my plus one. And I remember when she was a senior in high school, she asked if she'd bring one of her friends to an event we were going to. And I said, sure, I asked for if the host of it would be okay. And her friend was immobilized and not able to work the room. My daughter worked the room like a pro because she'd been doing it since she was about five years old. And so that's just one example. So she became very resilient and just, just very adept at mingling with people. 
Ruth, such a successful career, but I'm sure there have been disappointments and setbacks. How have you managed those? Is there any one that comes to mind? Well, you know, um, I would say personally, I lost my husband about 10 years ago, 10 and a half years ago. That was, that was hard. I could always recover from uh, anything that went wrong in, in my career. And, and I've been truly fortunate. Not much has gone wrong in my career. I've been, I've been very fortunate. But that, that personal loss was really hard for me. And so it took me a while to recover from that. Grief is a is a is a very hard thing. And so and it happens to all of us. And as a professional woman, you're in the public eye and you don't quite know how to grieve appropriately. When I had disappointments in life, I would just work my way through it. And I tried to do that with the loss of my husband and it didn't work. I had to actually go and get some grief counseling. And I worked with a counselor for a while and I finally found my footing. Um, that was really hard. And so for the, the jobs I've held, I've been very fortunate. Not everything has gone perfectly, but I just learned whatever I could from whatever job I had. I gave my best and I learned what I could and used it as a springboard to my next position. We're often very interested as well at her story uh, on the themes of sponsorship and mentors. And from your own experience, did you have sponsors or mentors that were instrumental for your growth? You know, I did not have mentors or sponsors. Uh, I think one of the closest was the woman who who uh, helped me get my first CEO job. And she is a friend to this day. Um, I did not have the benefit of a long-term sponsor or a mentor. And I really feel like that was the missing part of my career because I had to figure it out on my own. And because of that, uh, Cece, I am passionate about mentoring and sponsoring other women. Um, I can think of two examples, very recent examples of two women who just, uh, just assumed just really, really great roles. And I played a part in that because uh, in one case, I introduced the person to the search uh, firm that was doing the search and the person sem- uh, subsequently got the job on another one. I had introduced both of those people to the same job and one got it and one didn't. And the the other one was looking at other roles and was thinking about taking a role that absolutely was not right for her. And I said, this is not the right role for you. I knew the organization, I knew the dynamics and I said, you will be miserable. And I just think you have too much to offer You've, you've worked too hard, you've come too far to be miserable. But I said, you make your own decision, but this is my, my personal opinion. So she just called me to tell me she's accepted a fabulous job and she thanked me for talking her through not taking that other role that would have absolutely not been right for her in my view. And I think she came to the same conclusion and she got a much better role, which she'll start here in a few weeks. Well, that's a terrific outcome to that story, although I do wonder if you hesitated at all to give her that kind of straight talk advice, because I think sometimes we may think of mentors and sponsors as being kind of our cheerleaders, right, our our boosters. And yet, you know, you were giving probably uh, some tough advice for her to hear at the time. You never want to discourage someone. I let her talk and tell me about the interview. And, and then she went on to tell me how the interview had gone and how it had made her feel. And it wasn't an uplifting feeling. There were red flags. And so when she told me that, cause she knew that I knew the organization. And I said, well, I don't normally do this but I'm just gonna tell you, you will be miserable. Um, you can make it work but you need to make up your own mind in terms of whether you need this job or whether you can can wait for something different because I believe something better and different will come along that will will 
will um, encapsulate all of your experiences and you will be much happier. And I said, but I would never tell you not to take the job. I'm just telling you my perception. And so I didn't know what she did. Um, I, I didn't talk to her because, you know, everybody gets busy, but she called me back and she said, thank you for, for, for helping me to see that that was not the right role for me. And I am just incredibly happy for her because I know she'll do a great job. Oh, fantastic. And, and the virtue of um, some honesty and candor, right? <laughs> you know, everybody has to make their own choice. And, but I, I think as women, we owe it to our mentees and sponsorees to be honest, to say, this is what I've seen. This is what I've experienced. Your experience may be different and let people make up their own minds about what they believe they can live with. Um, and, and that's a personal choice. But I, I think sometimes people aren't willing to be honest. We want to be too politically correct or too polite or too whatever we believe is the right thing to be when people really need honest advice. And that's what they're looking for from their mentors and sponsors. Or, or some women might, might settle quickly and you're just relieved they landed somewhere, right? Exactly, exactly. And sometimes you have to do that, um, CC. You know, depending on your family and life circumstances, you may have to do that. And you make the best of the situation. But in these, in this case, I knew that this person didn't need, I knew at least that this person didn't need to do that. At least I thought she didn't. For yourself, is there a particular trait or characteristic that you think has really helped propel you throughout your career and, um, you know, lots of ups and a couple of downs as well? You know, I love people and I love working with people. I believe in people. Um, and I have found that in my career that working with people, building teams, helping to develop people, pouring into other people is where I get my joy. And I guess that's why I've gravitated to mentoring and sponsorship. And no one succeeds alone. And we all have to work with other people to, to achieve any major objective. And so I find that working with people um, has been my, my source of joy, my source of contentment, my, it, it gives me a feeling of accomplishment when people I work with do well. And I, you know, when someone gets promoted, I am so happy for them because I take some pride in that. You know, the person had to do their own work and so forth, but I, I love that. I love seeing that. Now, there are sometimes you're disappointed by people and you wonder how could this person have done this and what were they thinking? And, and in those cases, if it's, if it's possible, you try to forgive the person and help them move on. Sometimes people um, inflict self-inflicted self wounds and, and you can't save them. Um, but hopefully in those cases, the person has learned something very valuable for themselves and, don't, and won't repeat that. We are all human, so I yeah. think another great trait of yours is that ability to forgive and understand and, and help the others learn, as you say. Uh, at Her Story, we often like to give you the opportunity to come up with a title for your own story. And I wonder, Ruth, if you might have one. You know, I have been mulling this story over in my mind for a long time. And the title I would give my story is Roses Still Bloom in Winter. And it's metaphorical because I love roses. That's my favorite flower. And I, uh, and, and what it means is that um, you, can, you can bloom at any time. And the way I came up with it um, years ago, many years after my grandmother died, uh, I was at her house and uh, her old house and she had a beautiful flower garden. And I spent many years pulling weeds and working in that flower garden. So I knew that garden and when I remember how small it looked then. And when I was a, a child growing up, it just looked huge. 
But anyway, um, the, the yard, it was winter time and the yard had grown up and there were dead weeds all over. And I was thinking, oh my goodness, she would absolutely be fit to be tied if, if she saw her garden looking this way. And just as I was turning around to leave the garden and go back into the house, I looked and I saw this white rose, just healthy, pure white, not a stain on the petals, just growing in all these weeds, these brown dead weeds. And I often remember that. And I think to myself, this is a metaphor for, for women, for people that no matter what um, weeds surround you and may threaten to, to choke out your existence, you can still survive and you can bloom in any season. It's never too late. And it's, it, you just have to be resilient and to keep moving. So I, that's, that's what I chose. Roses still do bloom in winter, even though most of them bloom in summer, some wait until winter and they still bloom. Well, I, I think it is a fantastic title. Now we're gonna have to get going on the book, Ruth. <laughs> And what a wonderful uh, high note and image to conclude this delightful conversation with Ruth Williams Brinkley. Thank you so much for joining her story. 